Okay, so um, I'm Mark Smith from Dyke in Europe. I'm the flight system specialist here in the Irish office. Dyke are one of the largest air conditioning manufacturers in the world. We do domestic, we do commercial, we do industrial, ventilation, the whole range. For this presentation, what I'm going to focus on is heat recovery with chiller systems. Basically, trying to get some of the energy back where you put into it. Okay? So, as part of Daikin, we always aim for three major things as part of your interaction with us support, optimal condition of the equipment, and optimal performance. Basically, we, we acknowledge that physical equipment that we sell is only a small part of the experience. This type of equipment, it's an investment, normally has a lifetime, 15, 20 years, so you need to look after it, get the most out of it. They can use a lot of power, they can be very, they can use a lot of power compared to the rest of power, because compared to the rest of the uses, because they're generally processed equipment, okay? For this, I'm gonna focus on the actual performance of all the systems. Basically, that's not just the performance that's claimed at the time of manufacture, that's the whole life of the system when you take into account things change on site, that the requirements change. Right, so as I said, basically we're looking at heat recovery here from a point of view of a chiller or a piece of equipment gets put in initially with a certain requirement. At a certain point, a few years later, the company decides, all right, we actually need some hot water as well. Things have changed slightly compared to the original plan. Maybe they decide to make a new product, a new manufacturing process. Things can change, and they want, now they want to focus on how can we get the most production, the most energy efficiency out of our complete plant. Not look at it as, here is our air conditioning, here is our water, here is electricity. They're all linked as one big process. So, as I said, chiller heat recovery. As the name implies, basically we're trying to recover some of the energy that you put into a chiller to get your chilled water. We're assuming here that producing chilled water is process critical and the primary driver of this equipment. You need chilled water. If we can recover energy from it, get some energy back from it, that's brilliant. But the chilling, the chilled water is primarily what you need and will always be required. It's a driving force. Heat recovery is possible through two ways. One, is a factory installed option for any new equipment, which in itself is very interesting from a design point of view to see, do we, do we have a requirement to have water on the site? Can we incorporate heat recovery and minimize our total running costs? But it's also interesting to look at, I have an existing system existing chiller which is creating chilled water as was meant to and so it's producing hot, chilled water as was meant to but all of a sudden we decided actually we also need hot water somewhere else in the, in the plant at the same time maybe a different process could be a different product that's being made it could just be for general utilities but we finally realized finally accepted that oh wait we do need hot water somewhere on site at the same time why are we wasting energy, rejecting, it, rejecting heat out through a chiller when, when we could be, be harnessing it. So, we look now, who is likely to want heat recovery? Basically it comes down to a lot of people. If you take sports and leisure, you have a gym. Gyms are very hot, they cool them a lot. Take the energy out of there, why eject it out into the atmosphere through your chiller? Recover it because at the same time as a gym needing cooling, it also needs hot water. So you have a simultaneous demand for heating and cooling. Same thing, apartments and corrective housing. Less of an issue here in Ireland, but as a general idea, a lot of the time some places need to be cooled, but you also need hot water in the apartment. You also need showers, so why not recover the energy? Don't spend money cooling one place and spend more money heating another thing. Transfer the energy from A to B. Food processing and storage is another major one. 
a lot of food processing procedures involve cooling down the product at the end, chilling them. So you're using cold, wa cold water in some form to chill a product or chill a process. But at the same time, you're going to spend a lot of money heating up water to clean out cooking vessels, to clean out production vessels, to do a lot of cleaning, keep the facility clean and hygienic. Why spend money cooling and spend more, spend more money heating? It's all about covering the energy. Hotels as well. Typically, you're cooling the bar, you're cooling the foyer, you could be cooling some of the rooms. But at the same time, you're creating hot water. So why not throw the energy from the foyer, the bedrooms, the bar, whatever it is that's generating heat in the kitchen, put it into your hot water. Maybe you might not do the whole hot water demand, but you're saving money. Manufacturing as well at the same time, you're cooling one thing, heating something else. You, you, you can see that the theme is coming here. Quite a lot of places that you might not think of, they need hot water, they also need to cool at the same time. So don't spend money doing the two activities, transfer from one to the other. As a basic idea, okay? Heat recovery is, as it sounds, recovering energy. Always the primary driver is, I need to cool place A. Be it a process, be it a room, whatever, but you always need cooling. That's your primary driver. Traditionally, you'd be cooling the water, and you take the energy, you eject it out through the fans of the machine, out into the atmosphere, and say the be. You lost the energy, that's what happened. What I'm talking about here is you still have all your cooling, but instead of transferring the energy out into the air and losing it, hold it into a hot water loop. Typically, you can get 40, 45 degree hot water out of it. And you're talking about recovering about 80, maybe 85% of the total energy you put into the system, you can get out of the system. The exact operating conditions will determine exactly how much you get out, but typical value is 80, 85%. So, as you can see here, one of the main criteria is you must need cooling and heating at the same time. I don't necessarily mean exactly minute to minute, because you can always store hot water in a bucket tank, a hot water tank. But within the same day, you have heating and cooling required in the same building. You also need to have enough hot water requirement to justify it, because oh, I won't lie, it's an expensive option. You have to look at your demand. If you have a huge cooling demand and a tiny little hot water demand, maybe it's not worth it. But if your hot water demand is big enough compared to your cooling demand, it can well pay back. I have examples later on. Okay, so again, I said, who? Where would you use the hot water? Hot water isn't necessarily just for the sinks in the bathroom, for a shower, if, if, any, if you're in a factory. It could be for the fresh air in your building. It could be being heated in an air, in an air handling unit. Why not use it there? You could need it for sanitary hot water, so for the, for the kitchen, or if you have showers, for under your sink. It's all hot water. If you have a swimming pool, an extreme example, but hey, some people have swimming pools. Also, you, could, you can also remember, yes, we're getting 45 degree hot water. Your process may need 80 degree hot water, but you can use this water, the, the chiller, to preheat and minimize the load on your, your traditional heating system. Just use the energy somewhere. You may need to supplement it, you may need to top it up, but it's all reduction in running costs. You may just minimize running time on the existing systems. Okay. Why to do it? Just have some concrete examples here of figures for you, okay? We look at this, this particular chiller. It's a basic entry level 500 kilowatt air cooled chiller. Fairly typical for process cooling applications in Ireland, okay? You get 494 kilowatts of cooling out of this machine, okay? To do that, you need to put in 189 kilowatts of electrical power input, and the machine is rejecting through the fans 683 kilowatts of heat. So basically, all the energy that went into it has to go out of it, goes out in heat. 
Traditionally, it was a case of, well, this is what happens, this is what the machine does, takes energy from point A, puts it point into point B, point B happens to be the atmosphere. Okay? The efficiency of this particular machine, remember this is a basic entry level machine, is your cooling capacity divided by your power input, in this case, 2.62. So it's fairly decent, but again, it's an entry level, it's not the top of the range or anything. Now, if we took the exact same machine and put a heat recovery option into it, you would still get, you get 473 kilowatts of cooling capacity out of it. You've got 191 kilowatts of power input into it, but now we're only rejecting into the atmosphere 104 kilowatts of heat because we're taking out 560 kilowatts of hot water. So the total amount of energy is still the same, we're just redirect, re redirecting some of the energy into a useful point. In this case, we're talking about 45 degrees, this example side, we're talking about 40 degree hot water, but typically we can go 40, 40 degree, 45 degree, 55 degree, up to 55 degree hot water. The point is, now we have 560 kilowatts of heating capacity of hot water in a useful medium you can use hot water in many places in your facility. If we look at the raw figures, the chiller efficiency, so the physical mechanical efficiency, has actually gone down to 2.47, but we've got 560 kilowatts worth of useful hot water. Again, I come back to the point, this is a very, very useful option when you have a demand for hot water. The hot water demand is one of your key drivers here. You must be able to use the energy. Okay? Now, this is where I actually make these modifications. The additional cost of this sort of option, and this is the financial cost, it's about 20% of the cost of the chiller. So depending on the chiller, obviously the size of the recovery option changes, so the cost changes while you're talking, approximately 20% additional capital investment to get this back. So it's not something that you do lightly, you do need to do an analysis to see will you get to pay back. Okay, I have some figures now for you. Just before that, just a, an idea of what, how it works. On the left there you've got a typical, typical pip piping system. So you've basically got two heat exchangers, a compressor and expansion valve on the left. But when you go and add the heat, the heat recovery option, all you're doing is adding an extra heat exchanger and a controller. So it's relatively simple to do. It's say, heat exchanger and controller. And the controller is very important. Because the controller means that we can actively manipulate the chiller to maximize the hot water output at the temperature that we want. You set, I want 40 degree hot water, that's what you get. The chiller will adjust itself to maximize the amount of hot water you get out, therefore the total system efficiency, not the machine cooling efficiency. So you're maximizing how much hot water, you're maximizing your payback. Okay? Case study of an example that we did in Italy. Two machines in Italy doing a TV station. Okay? You can see on the left, typical layout underneath it. Nothing terribly interesting. We retrofitted the heat recovery option onto the existing units, and you can see now underneath the machine, a lot more components, more heat exchangers, more piping, a lot of work. So, typical energy consumption for a year for this particular television station, okay? We have AHUs, air handling unit, the pumps, ventilation, heating, power input, cooling, power. Uh, power consumption, okay? The others are all things that we have no influence on whatsoever from the air conditioning point of view, so we talk them as being fixed, okay? So as you can see here, in this particular year, the, the TV station had power consumption in heating and cooling pretty similar, almost the same. In this case, the heating consumption, 7,000 megawatt hours. A lot, of like, a lot of power input, a lot of cost, because the TV station, your cooling equipment all year round, your cooling 
the TV studio is all year round. It could be minus five outside. Your TV studio is still going to be very hot and still be cooled. You have a continuous cooling demand all the time. You also have hot water demand because there's lots of people. They have showers. They have hot water sinks. Up the sinks. They have some space heating done by the heating. So during the winter, you can use that energy. The aim of this particular project, from the TV's point, TV station's point of view, was reduce the CO2 emissions. We want to be able to see, be seen, be making an effort to be green. Obviously, you also want to reduce the absolute running costs of their equipment from an energy point of view, and specifically lower the heating cost of the building. As I said, TV studio needs cooling all year round. Computer room needs cooling all year round. They heat the, hot, they heat the offices with hot water. They have, on this, on, they have uh, sinks, showers, all that sort of stuff, sanitary hot water. They have a big demand for hot water a lot of the year. Now, as I showed you here first, here's the power consumption before the retrofit. After the retrofit, the power consumption on heating dropped down to 4,200 megawatt hours, approximately 25%. Their cooling, class, their cooling power input didn't change a lot because they're still doing all the cooling. They still have the heating consumption because the hot water that they recover with the chillers wasn't enough to completely satisfy the demand, but they've made a huge dent on their, power, on their heating consumption. So in this case, approximately 25%. So, as I said, this was basically done by retrofitting this type of heat recovery onto the two units. And with the costs involved and stuff, payback was estimated roughly half a year. Because they, because they have a large demand, they run, their run times are quite long, they're basically running 24 7. Their paybacks are going to be a lot shorter than if it was an office only running 9 to 5 with, with minimum run hours. This is a pretty nice example, but you can see payback is very, very reasonable and very appropriate when you have the application. Give you an idea here, the types of equipment that can be retrofitted, so existing systems out there. So we've got a range of units, different sizes. The names of them are not relevant, the point being they range from about 300 odd kilowatts up to the biggest unit we did, so lar larger scale process applications, so three, 300 kilowatts up approximately. If you were to try to do this option for a new unit, you actually have options all the way from 180 kilowatts up to 1.8 megawatts, no problem, as a factory installed option straight away. Now, so summarize benefits from heat recovery, be it a retrofit or a new installation or a factory installed option. Reduce carbon footprint of the client's total project or total facility. Low net running costs, so chiller plus heating. And you get to recover the temperature into, into a controlled hot water system. You can choose what temperature hot water you get from it. So that's my presentation over. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions.